So Steve, um, we talked uh, two weeks ago about the Zika virus and its effects on the world. Um, and there's been significant movement since. Um, one of the big movements is the administration's request uh, for $1.9 billion to deal with this. Um, but the minute that's been stalled in Congress, um, what's gone into that? Well, the administration came forward with $1.9 billion as a first investment in most of it going for building capacity here in the United States, some of it for overseas support, uh, some of it for mosquito control, some of it for care and support of victims, some of it of protecting vulnerable women who are the most acute, particularly poor women, the most acute and vulnerable population, some of it to accelerate the science, get new tools in the mix uh, and the like, but it's, it's, it's stuck in a standoff between the administration, the Obama administration, and uh, Republican appropriators, particularly in the House. Th those appropriators are arguing that uh, surplus monies that they allege are unobligated in the earlier health security uh, supplemental for the Ebola outbreak from December of 2014, that $5.4 billion, that money should come out of that to go towards this. The administration's position is those monies were for one set of purposes that are, remain very worthy and they should not be robbing Peter to pay Paul. The deeper problem here is we have no routine, systematic, and rational way of funding our response to these emergencies, particularly when we're talking about building capacity. It's all built on our, our response is built on emergencies and on these big, chunky emergency supplementals, and that's no way to try and do this. You wouldn't fund your fire department or your p police department in this fashion. And the net result is that the U.S. government, which is struggling to outfit, to get ahead of the game and outfit our coastal communities, which are going to see Zika in the summer months, to get them ahead of the game in preparing in terms of uh, putting screening, air conditioning, uh, mosquito vector control, uh, and, and, and preparing for on the medical side as well. And we're, 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 we're sitting on our hands, we're going into this fight uh, ill-prepared, and, and, and this is delaying. And the, one of the reasons that it's delayed is that the impact in terms of birth defects, microcephalic infants being born to mothers infected by the Zika virus, that impact is somewhere out in the future. Um, and we, we will begin to see, see that on our soil. We'll begin to see it in large numbers in Puerto Rico. We'll see it in very large numbers in Brazil and Colombia and elsewhere. But it's down the road. The threat is not yet fully understood and fully seen, which makes it difficult. And we talked about US, uh, the effect on the US, and ground zero seems to be Puerto Rico right now. Um, what's being done there to uh, manage the virus and manage the uh, reaction to it? Well, CDC has mobilized. It has a dengue control center that it's mobilized that's, that's in place, and they brought in additional folks. Tom Frieden, the director of CDC, was just there this week. Uh, there's an there's a all-out mobilization to work in partnership with the governor of Puerto Rico. Um, you're right, it's ground zero. Uh, z the Zika infections are doubling every seven days down there. It's sweeping across the population. In Puerto Rico, there will be 34,000 uh, uh, infants born in Puerto Rico this year. Uh, when you do the math from as this epidemic sweeps and you go nine months out, we're looking at some very sizable numbers of likely of microcephalic uh, b infants born with uh, serious birth defects. Uh, Puerto Rico faces really serious problems, uh, financial crisis, uh, very complicated and difficult politics and very limited capacities. And when you're talking about poverty, you're talking about poor populations, vulnerable poor women in particular, without screening, without um, uh, air conditioning, uh, living in the midst of environments that have lots, offer lots of homes and wet, wet environments for the mosquito, um, that's very dangerous. And I think uh, that is why it's being referred to as a ground zero in terms of U.S. territory, populations that, 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 that are, that are, that are uh, un within our system. And uh, we talked about that, these, that it's, it's women who are, are very much at, at risk here. Um, what, kind of, what kind of levels of, of risk are, are we talking about here? Obviously microcephaly in babies, but there seems to be um, a societal risk as well, especially in these um, Latin American countries. Well, yes, the, um, 
the, the biggest risk is, is, is a poor woman who becomes pregnant uh, uh, in the first trimester or early into the second trimester. Uh, that is the, that is the, the highest um, risk. And um, in many of these societies, uh, contraception, uh, access to contraception is, is poor. Abortion is outlawed. Um, women's empowerment is, is, is very, very limited. Um, and this has brought forward inevitably uh, quite a debate um, around these issues. Uh, in those societies, it's going to bring forward a debate within our own society um, around, around these, these questions of access to contraception uh, and to abortion. There's, a, there's a, 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 a sense in some societies, like Salvador, that women should postpone pregnancy for a period of two years uh, as this epidemic sweeps through with the hope that it sweeps through and people acquire immunities and it becomes less dangerous. Um, that is, is not something that is seen as particularly practical but it's also something that many people, many experts are arguing should get greater emphasis. Well, let's talk about the science based on that. Um, first off, uh, the idea of a vaccine, and this seems to be um, jumping off the Ebola debate where you had uh, the industry put a lot of money into this um, and then see not much of a result. Are we seeing the same then with Zika? Well, in the Ebola case, you had uh, three of the major global firms jump forward and, in good faith, uh, accelerate efforts to develop vaccines. And among the three of them, across the three of them, over a billion dollars expended, very little to show for that. This is engendering a certain amount of caution and hesitation about, wait a second, how are we just going down this road again? This is no way to prepare for this type of uh, of meeting this type of challenge. We can't, uh, the industry, in its view, can't be doing this year in, year out with a proliferation of these types of emerging infectious threats. What it means, in essence, is that the startup uh, phase of, of, of action has, has to come back to the NIH, to the National Institutes of Health. Um, the U.S. government has to jump in, as it has in this case, to try and to try and accelerate the development of vaccines. There are some promising efforts underway, but they're not, they're, they're no quick magic bullets. Uh, we're likely to see a vaccine in three to four years, perhaps, if we're, if we're lucky, that's usable. And it seems like the knowledge about Zika is increasing week by week. I mean, when we were talking before, there was um, an idea that you know, maybe it was uh, transferred uh, by mail sexually, um, but now it's becoming more and more clear that that's the case. It seems that these kind of um, jumps in knowledge are happening all the time. We're seeing some very uh, major discoveries unfold in a week by week, day by day basis. Uh, one of the most significant, of course, was the discovery that, in fact, um, uh, 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 men uh, who travel to Zika areas become infected, can transmit that Zika virus through their semen. Uh, to uh, their partners uh, di way, way back home in non-Zika areas. That was not expected. Um, I, I, I want to emphasize one other very important point on the science. There has never been a case of a mosquito-borne virus that causes birth defects. This is new and different. Okay, we're starting on, on, on new terrain here. Secondly, in terms of major birth defect defects. It's been 50 years since we've seen a new pathogen come forward in this regard. So this is very challenging. This is very new. There's much that we do not know about this. We don't know how long the virus remains active in men's semen. We do not know how vulnerable women remain if they just become uh, bitten by a Zika uh, uh, bearing, bearing mosquito, but they don't become symptomatic or let's say they do become symptomatic, how long does that last? How long do they remain vulnerable? We, we've, we, we, there's, there's recent science that shows that the Zika virus um, crosses the placenta, begins to attack uh, the, um, the brain cells in the brain stem, and generates a multitude, a suite of different brain defects. Uh, so we're talking about not just one condition. When we talk about microcephaly, we're talking about a suite 
of, of damaging conditions that can proliferate out of that. That means, in effect, that our knowledge, we discover one thing only to realize how much more we do not know. So it's, uh, from a scientific standpoint, this is a, a, a very fast moving, very, in some ways, very stimulating, uh, uh, but scary story. And the knowledge gap remains very substantial. Given what we don't know then, uh, we talked about this previously, but it still begs the question, the Rio Olympics in Brazil, where there's been a high amount of cases of the Zika virus, how can that go ahead? Should that go ahead? This is a really tough, uh, a really tough situation uh, with the August uh, Olympics uh, in Brazil. Um, the the government there is loath to uh, to uh, suspend, postpone, or relocate uh, the Olympics for obvious reasons. Uh, they also don't want to uh, be inviting um, uh, and 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 putting at risk. Um, uh, women who may become pregnant or who are already pregnant. But we're beginning to see that those risks come from multiple directions, right? Men can come to the Olympics and carry the risk back home. Um, and each of the national governments, the Olympic committees, are hiring in infectious disease experts. Uh, they're trying to, to consult with the athletes. Um, the, there are got new guidelines, new tougher guidelines from CDC. There's new tougher guidelines from the World Health Organization advising women on, 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 on uh, uh, thinking really hard about uh, coming to uh, Zika areas, and that includes Rio, uh, Rio de Janeiro. Now, the summer will be dry, uh, and so maybe the mosquito risk can be lowered. There are mosquito control measures being undertaken to try and lower um, the exposure, but we don't know. And the perilous risk, the really perilous risk in this situation is that you do get a, uh, a, a number of transmissions, a number of infections that result in birth defects nine months later. You don't want to have a situation where this has a carburetor effect, where it the Olympics accelerates an epidemic of microcephalic infants uh, with, with grave damage. That would be a tragedy. So I think this is quite a perilous and difficult situation that the Olympics face right now. And, um, and there's no easy, quick answer to, to this, and it's going to continue to unfold in the next, uh, in the next months in the lead up uh, to the Olympics. Well, this is moving so fast, I'm sure this won't be the last time we're talking about it. Thank Steve you. Morrison, thanks for joining me. Thank you.